So this morning, church family, we are going to be on uh, in part two of Matthew chapter five. We're breaking it up into, I think, I'm thinking three. Three should be good. I think next time we'll be able to uh, to wrap up chapter five. I just don't want to go too quickly since it's such a uh, such a rich passage. So much awesome stuff in there. So this morning, we're going to be covering Matthew chapter 5, verses uh, 13 through 30. So let's go ahead. Let's read over it, and then we'll, we'll start to take it apart. So starting in verse 13, it says, and this is Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown in prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Pretty heavy passage, huh? Cheery, right? Well, that's why we teach verse by verse. Because uh, if you don't teach verse by verse... You're probably never going to teach this passage, right? You're going to be like, let's go to something a little funner. But the reality is this is an incredible passage. It's such an encouraging passage when you really understand what's being said here and why it's being said. Oh my gosh, it's priceless. So let's go ahead and begin by breaking it down, starting to take it apart. Take a look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So we're all familiar with salt, right? It brings out flavor. That's usually what we use it for today. But if you've ever had something like beef jerky, right? Do you have to refrigerate beef jerky? No. How come? Because it's so salty, right? It's been salted. It's preserved using salt. And so that's what it was mostly used for in ancient times. Salt was used as a preservative, so to speak. So it, not only does it make things taste better, bring out flavor, but it also preserves them. So 
Today, we're used to the salt that we get at the grocery store, right? It's like a, it's like white powder that's all pure and everything like that. If you dissolve it, you know, and then evaporate it, you'll just have the salt, right? It just, it'll be right there again. But back in the ancient times, the salt wasn't like that nice, crisp, clean powder that we have today. It had a lot of impurities. It would have calcium carbonate. It would have all sorts of things in it. So basically, if you stored your salt incorrectly, it could actually lose its sodium content because salt is water soluble, right? And a lot of these other things aren't water soluble, a lot of these impurities. So then you could have what looks like salt, but it's not salty and it won't be useful for preserving. It won't bring out the flavor. It wouldn't taste right, right? And more importantly, it wouldn't preserve. That's the main thing. Does that sound familiar? Jesus says, we're the salt of the earth. Are we preserving our culture today? Not so much anymore, huh? The salt has lost its saltiness. It still looks like salt, right? People still call themselves Christians, but we're not doing much to preserve the world anymore, right? Now, we don't need a ton of salt to act as a preservative. That's the amazing thing about it. Just a little, just a little bit of salt will pres preserve something pretty well. The sad thing is, we don't even have a little remnant. We have a very tiny remnant, but nowhere near enough of a remnant to actually preserve and uh, bring out the flavor, so to speak, in our, in our culture, in our world. And that's tragic. You know, the salt has lost its saltiness. It's lost its sodium content. And what, what do you do when that happens? Well, Jesus tells us right here, you get rid of it because it's useless. You know, you can't use it in the field which would be, you know, throwing it into the, the, the garden, basically. You couldn't do that because that would, call, that would cause uh, mineral uptake deficiencies. You know, if you throw some salt in your water and water your plants, what happens to your plants? Yeah, right? They all die. You're like, oh, that did not work good at all. It would cause lockout, and then it wouldn't be able to take up potassium. And it's a whole other whole conversation. But you can't use it in the field, and you can't throw it in the compost pile for the same reasons. It'll mess with the bacteria and then the compost process won't work. So what can you do with it? Because anywhere you put the salt, it'll prevent plants from growing, right? It's useless, except there is one use for it. You could put it in the pathway. You don't want plants growing, right? On the roads, you don't want weeds, right? That's not useful. And if it ever, you know, a puddle forms and then it gets cold, it could freeze, but the salt would prevent that too, right? So that's great. Salt's useful for that. Unfortunately, we're the church and the image here is of the church and we don't want to be walked on, right? We don't want to be in the pathway, but that's exactly what we see today, right? The church is being walked all over, right? Church is no longer preserving the world. We're just getting walked on. We're getting stepped on. You notice that? And the reason is because we've lost our saltiness. We're no longer useful. All you can do is just throw it into the road. And now, obviously, we see that very familiar, very clear imagery God's showing us, you know, <laughs> this is us, this is the church, this is what's happened when we've uh, compromised on the word of God, the teaching of the word of God, and, uh, you know, you go to the average church, we've talked about it, it's two jokes and a story, or two stories and a joke, and you leave there, and the only thing you remember is that you feel good, you're encouraged, and you know some new funny jokes, you, knew, you know some new funny stories, it's tragic. And how does this happen? Well, because Christ's followers, like the salt, are spending time in the wrong environments, right? If the salt gets wet, right? If it gets exposed to water, it loses its saltiness because it's in the wrong environment. Sound familiar? Same thing. The Christians are in the wrong environment. They're spending too much time watching TV or on social media or doing all, listening to garbage music, all these different kinds of things. And if things are rotten in America, if things are rotten in the world, we don't blame the world. The world's the world. You know, we blame the church because you don't need a ton of salt to preserve. You just need a little, but we don't even have that. Isn't that tragic? So we can't really lay blame for what we see going on in the world today. We can't really lay blame for that. You know, at the world, it's our fault. It's the church's fault. We've lost our saltiness. Take a look at verses 14 and 15. They kind of build upon this. It says, you, this is Jesus, of course, again speaking. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Light 
enables us to see, right? It exposes what's hidden in the darkness, thereby destroying the darkness. If you want to get rid of the darkness, do you, do you like swat it away and try to get rid of it? No, you just flip on a light, right? And America, is it getting dark? Yeah. How come? Because we're not shining our light. We're not reflecting the light of Jesus Christ. It's not the world's fault. Again, it's the church's fault. We're not exposing the darkness. And if some churches do, I know we try to expose the darkness. We talk about the stuff going on in the world. We have actually gotten pushback, even from those within Calvary Chapel. <laughs> and they don't want you exposing the darkness. They're like, shh. And most Calvaries do talk about this kind of stuff. But, you know, a lot of them, they're like, whoa, hey, tone it down. But the Bible says, have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. That's what we should be doing. It's easier to not talk about stuff when it's weird, right? Like, eh, I don't want to talk about that. People will think I'm weird, you know? But then at the end of the day, the darkness runs rampant. We lose our saltiness. And then we're getting walked all over and we're in the darkness. Sounds real fun, right? It's tragic. But all too often, even in the church, I use the church air quotes, right? The professing church, I should say, uh, the light becomes dark. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter six, verse 32. He talks about how, how dark is that darkness? How does he say it? He says, uh, if the darkness in you is, if the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? We'll see it in the next chapter. Jesus talks about this, but the reality is guys, that darkness didn't just happen magically. It's because a lot of churches have departed from the teaching of the word of God. And that's why you have churches where the light that they shine is no longer the true light of Jesus Christ. It's a counterfeit light. You can drive around town and you'll see churches from denominations that used to be rock solid. And now they're flying rainbow flags out front. You'll see it with Presbyterians. You'll see it with Methodists. You'll see it with all sorts of different groups. How did that happen? How did the light become darkness? Because they departed from the word of God. They walked away from the teaching of the word of God and the light became darkness. And that's why the light is no longer so bright shining in America, huh? There's a few churches. There's a few denominations that are still trying to, you know, stand for the, the truth, stand for the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But man, it's getting darker and darker. Like, just like Jesus warned us, if the light that is in you is dark, how great is that darkness? And that's what we see. But we ourselves, we also need to take heed because in a more practical sense, this can apply to us too if we're not careful. Are we hiding our light? Are we compromising our witness before men? Because it's easier to do that, right? It's easier to not say anything, right? It's not easier to not say anything when your coworker says, oh, I'm a Buddhist or you know, I, I'm a homosexual or whatever they say, right? I'm gay. I guess that's the way they say it, right? Do we just go along to get along? I'm a Mormon. Do we go along to get along or do we talk to them about Jesus Christ and tell them, hey, you know, the Bible says this and I love you enough to tell you that. Oh, I might lose my job. Well, awesome. Praise the Lord. You finally suffered for the first time in your life for Jesus Christ. Hey, round of applause. You know, I mean, we're not asked to give up much in the Western world. You know, people aren't putting guns to our heads and saying, deny Jesus Christ. That's happening all over the world right now as we speak. Right now as we speak, there's somewhere, someone in this world right now with a gun to their head, they're saying, deny Jesus Christ or we're going to kill you. It's going on all the time, guys. And we're like, oh, I might lose my job. Well, praise God. You finally suffered for Christ. Hey, awesome. We've got to be bold. We can't hide our light. We've got to shine our light before men. We've got to share the love of Jesus Christ with people. And verse 16 actually tells us exactly that. Take a look at verse 16. It says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Galatian, Galatians uh, chapter 6, verse 10 tells us, Do good to all men especially those of the household of faith, right? We want to do good. We want to try to, you know, bless people if we can, if there's some way that we can do that. But, you know, there's some churches, denominations, groups, charities, what have you, ministries. That's all they do. 
right? They just try to give people things and bless them. Oh, you guys need food. Oh, you guys need clothes. Or we're a social justice ministry. What is that? There's only one kind of ministry that God recognizes. And that's a ministry that shares the gospel with people or ministers to the church, which I think are hand, hand in glove, right? But you see this. This is going on right now all around the world where they're doing good to all men, but they're ignoring the second part of that verse. Look what it says there at the end. So that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's the condition, guys. It's not magical. It's not just so that they see your good works. No, it's so that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And church, if we're not careful, we can do our good works in a way that glorifies us instead of the Father. Right? Oh, wow, he's so generous. Oh, that church is so great. They do so many good things. Wait, then the focus is on us or our church or our denomination or ministry or whatever it is. That's not what Jesus says, is it? He says, it's, if you look at what he's saying, it's really clear. He says, do your works in a way that when the people see it, they glorify your father in heaven. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Not you, not your church or your, your ministry. But God. And then we can use it as a way to glorify God and to open the door to share Christ with people. How awesome is that? But God doesn't share his glory. So if we want the focus to be on us, that's going to work. We can get the glory. We can get the focus on us. But you're going to close that door to be able to share the gospel with people. It's one or the other. You can't have it both ways. Take a look at verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You know, there are some people who would point to this verse to try to make the case that as Christians, we need to keep the law. You guys ever heard that? They'll be like, oh, are you uh, keeping the Sabbath? Are you eating pork? Well, that's, well, that's legalism. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about that right now. That's called a lot of that creeps in. It's the Hebrew roots movement. A lot of it comes in. It's this really, really trendy thing on YouTube. Like all false, false doctrine, all false doctrine flourishes on YouTube. <laughs> a solid teaching. It gets maybe 10,000 views for if it's from someone famous, a false teaching gets like 10 million views. It's amazing. I don't know. People are just drawn to it like a moth to the flame. Maybe YouTube's algorithm promotes false doctrine. I would not be surprised in the least, but there's people that they point to this verse and they try to make the case that we're under the law, that we need to keep the law of Moses, that we need to, you know, keep the Sabbath and not work at all on Saturday, don't do anything, just sit in your house and, you know, read your Bible, pray, you know, hang out, you know, play a board game. I don't know what they, I don't know what they would say you do, but they'll say you shouldn't eat pork or, or shellfish or any of that, can't eat any of that kind of stuff. You got to keep the dietary laws. You got to do all that stuff. But it's important to see what Christ says here. He says, he fulfilled the law. He completed the law. He accomplished the law. That's what the word fulfilled means. He came to fulfill it. If something's fulfilled, do you need to do it again? Right? If you fulfill your obligation, do you still have that obligation? No, it's completed, right? It's done. He accomplished it. And if we're in Jesus Christ, if we're Christians, then his works are counted on our behalf. He lived the perfect life, did we? No, but we get credit for the perfect life, right? We're forgiven for our sins because he did. And we're in him. That's what the Bible says. We're in Christ. That's the term that it talks about for being saved. You're in Christ. And if we're in Christ, if our life is hidden in Christ, then we, in Christ, have also fulfilled the law. We've kept the law but because Christ kept the law. And as we read in uh, Romans 7, and Galatians 2.19, we're dead to the law. And now we live for 
and in and by Jesus Christ. He's our righteousness. He's our Sabbath rest. We're no longer accepted through our, our, through our obedience to the ceremonial law with all of its washings and sacrifices and rituals and ordinances and all these things. That's how in the Old Testament, that's how you found your righteousness before God. Right? You had to do those things if you wanted to come before God. But now we're no longer under those things. Now we're accepted in the beloved as we read in Ephesians 1.6. We're no longer accepted through keeping the laws and the rituals and all these things. We're accepted in the beloved. We're accepted in Jesus Christ. Jesus did all the doing. Isn't that cool? He fulfilled the law. And it also tells us that he fulfilled the prophets. He fulfilled the Old Testament promises of a Savior who would be born of a virgin in Bethlehem, and it gives us all these hundreds of incredible prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of a Messiah. And all these prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And just as Christ fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies about his first coming, he'll also fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies about the day of the Lord and the New Testament prophecies about his second coming. Take a look at verse 18. Verse 18 says basically that, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Do you guys know? We, know? we know about all these incredible prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, right? The first coming. There's all these incredible prophecies. Right? It talks about his hands and his feet being pierced. You know, it talks about being betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, how he'd ride a donkey into Jerusalem. It talks about all this incredible stuff. It even tells the exact day that he would ride the donkey. Remember we were talking about that? Did you know that there's eight times as many prophecies about Jesus' second coming as there is about his first coming? Isn't that crazy? Because there's so many about his first coming. There's eight times as many about his second coming. Now, his first coming, were all those prophecies literally fulfilled? Or were they spiritually fulfilled? They were literally fulfilled. And yet nowadays, about 70% of Christianity, 50 to 70%, depending on the metrics, say, oh, well, those are going to be spiritually fulfilled. Jesus isn't literally going to come back. Uh, which of the Old Testament prophecies about the coming of the Messiah were spiritually fulfilled? None of them. They were all literally fulfilled. And yet there's some people, a, a lot of people, perhaps even a majority of Christians who say, oh, well, you know, that's going to be the book of Revelation. Yeah, that's going to be spiritually fulfilled. What? Since when? Why? Because you don't like what it says? Yeah, that's not how this works. <laughs> we don't get to decide the parts of the Bible we like. This isn't a buffet. Oh, I'll take a little bit of grace. I'll take a little bit of encouragement. Ooh, judgment. Yeah, I'll, I'll hold off on the judgment this week, thanks. A lot of churches will cater to that. A lot of churches will cater to that. But there's eight times as many verses about the second coming of Jesus Christ as there is about the first. Guys, the word of God is eternal. That's what this says. It's not going to pass away. So how dare we neglect the teaching of the word of God? How dare we neglect prophecies? And yet the vast majority of Christianity does exactly that. Take a look at verse 19. It says, whosoever, excuse me, how does I want to say whosoever? It's probably the King James. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, meaning teaches men to do it, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Notice he doesn't lose his salvation, right? He loses his rewards. But whoever does and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. James chapter 3 verse 1 says, Let not many of you be teachers, for you will attain a harder judgment. Oh my gosh, that is not a joke. Right? That's a serious thing. But even if we're not teachers, you know, James 1.22 still applies. Right? We want to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word deceiving ourselves. If you just come to church and listen to all this stuff and never put it into practice, you're actually heaping up judgment for yourself because now you know what you should have done and you didn't do it. You'd be better not to know it. So we want to be doers 
of the word, not just hearers of the word. We don't want to be hypocrites, right? Telling people to do this and not doing it ourselves. <laughs> that would be not useful at all. But notice they don't lose their salvation. These hypocrites, because to a degree, like we've talked about, we're all hypocrites, right? It's the old church joke I've told you guys. If you ever meet someone, they're like, I don't want to go to church. It's full of hypocrites. I always say, don't worry, there's room for one more. Yeah. It's true, right? Take a look at verse 20. It says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh my gosh, what a terrifying verse. What on earth is Jesus talking about here? This is, how are we going to do that? And you think that's scary for us. Imagine how intimidating this must have been for the average Jew back then who looked up to the Pharisees as like the most righteous people you could imagine. These guys were like professional law keepers. <laughs> that was their life. All they did was keep the law. Imagine. But let's not forget Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Right? This is Bible 101. It says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Righteousness comes by faith, right? Now, question, church. Did the Pharisees believe in Jesus? Did the scribes believe in Jesus? And righteousness comes by faith. Huh. See how this is starting to make sense now? So who was more righteous? The people who were following Christ and putting their trust in him or the Pharisees with their outward displays of righteousness? Right. The people were. Because they believed in Jesus Christ. The work that God desires of us, I think it's John 6.30. I might be wrong. I think it's John 6.30. Is that we have faith in the one who God sent. That's the work that God desires of us. He doesn't want us to go around doing miracles. and all. God already has a son that did that. He just wants us to have faith. And God will do incredible miracles. We've seen it. He does it. It's awesome. He does incredible miracles. But that's not the focus. The focus is Jesus Christ, having faith in him. And if you have faith in Jesus Christ, guess what? You got more faith than the Pharisees, huh? You're more righteous than them because they didn't have faith in Jesus Christ. The best Pharisee in the world still broke the law, huh? And therefore their sin separates them from God. They need to have their sin paid for. Whereas if, if as Christians we're in Christ, our sins are all paid for. We're more righteous than the Pharisees. Because even though we blow it, our sins are paid for. Our sins are covered. It's a beautiful thing, right? And you can have peace about that verse when you understand that. You're like, okay, cool. Righteousness comes by faith. I got faith in Jesus Christ. The Pharisees and the scribes, they didn't. Makes perfect sense, right? Take a look at verses 21 and 22. We'll take them as a group. It says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Rakah, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. This is another one like, oh my gosh, right? What are we going to do? We've all said things like, like you fool, right? We, everybody has, if they can talk. Sometimes I wish I couldn't. But the reality is, guys, all sin separates us from God, right? Even socially acceptable sins, like calling someone a name when they do something bad. Oh, you fool, right? That's, that still separates us from God. Society might be cool with that, but God's not, right? God's not cool with that. God's like, nope, that's sin. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to read it for you guys. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened than it ca that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Our sin separates us from God. Even the socially acceptable ones that everybody thinks are okay. Why? Well, because he's infinitely good. Think of it like this. 
we hate judicial corruption, right? It's horrible. When the guilty go free, we all look at it like when they're letting all the prisoners out in California. Like, what? What? Like, what is, what's, what? They're just emptying the jails? Oh, that's great. That's, that's, that's going to be really good for the world, right? We all hate that. Or when, even worse, when a guilty person gets put to death or something. We've all heard of that. Like, oh, can you imagine being falsely accused of a crime? Yeah, that's pretty rough, right? We hate judicial corruption. We hate miscarriages of justice. But we expect God to just be like that? Like, oh, don't worry. Come on in. <laughs> come on. Yeah, yeah, you're a rapist. You're a murderer. Just come on in. You're good to go. No. Can you think of anything more terrifying than a corrupt judge who's all-powerful? It's terrifying, right? If God was like that, he wouldn't be good. He has to judge sin. Thankfully, he paid for it himself by becoming a man in the person of Jesus Christ and dying to pay for our sins. So our sins are righteously paid for. He didn't just ignore them. Oh, yeah, come on in. No worries. No, he can't do that. Our sin separates us from God. Whether it's a little sin like calling your brother a fool or whether it's a huge sin like murder or what have you. Jesus is our lawyer. And even better, he paid the price for our sins on the cross. And if we hate someone in our heart, we're in sin. Because sin is a heart issue, right? And unrepented of sin breaks fellowship, not relationship, with God. Breaks fellowship, not relationship. But it definitely does break fellowship as we see in verse 23. Take a look at verses 23 and 24. It says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Guys, we don't want to be hypocrites. We want to practice what we preach. And we need to seek restoration. Does that mean restoration will always be possible? Not on this side of eternity, right? You guys have seen that. But we should still try. You know, whether it's our fault, whether we wronged someone, or whether we've been wronged ourselves, we should try to seek restoration. Think of Romans chapter 12, verses 18 and 19. I'll read it to you. Romans chapter 12 verses 18 and 19. We all know Romans 12, 1 and 2, but keep reading verses 18 and 19. They say, if it is possible, meaning it's not always possible, as much as depends on you, meaning it doesn't always depend on you, live peaceably with all men. <laughs> I'm, I'm so thankful that he put those, those two first conditions, right? Because it would be pretty rough if he didn't, right? Imagine if it just said, live peaceably with all men. That would be really hard. <laughs> I'm human, like, I can't do this. These people are just insane. But it says, if it is possible, meaning it's not always possible, and as much as depends on you, meaning it doesn't always depend on you. Sometimes you try to, re you know, restore the relationship and they don't want anything to do with you. But it says, live peaceably with all men if you can. And look at verse 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, meaning God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay says the Lord. Isn't that awesome? That should give us peace, right? We should try to live well with all men as much as we can. Does that mean it's always going to work out perfectly and we're all going to sing Kumbaya? Not on this side of eternity. But the beautiful thing is, one day it all will be reconciled with our brothers and sisters in Christ who we have you know, issues with. And that's a beautiful thing. But at the end of the day, God desires obedience, not sacrifice, right? He wants you to obey and be loving and kind and patient and forgiving. Not to just go to church every Sunday and, you know, harbor hatred in your heart for your brother or what have you. That's hypocritical. Uh, take a look at verses 25 and 26. It says, agree with your adversary quickly while you were on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. As Christians, we need to choose our battles wisely, right? We shouldn't expect this life to be fair. 
We live in a fallen world. And we're children of the king. And God spanks his own children, not other people's children, right? So when you're like, Lord, what the heck? They do that all the time, and I do it once, and I get caught. And God's like, yep, you're my kid. I'm spanking you. They're not my kids. They're going to call them under judgment one day, and that's terrifying, right? So we shouldn't be like, oh, every time they get away with it, and I never get away with it. Yeah, that's because God loves you too much to let you get away with it. Does that mean we should raise a big stink? No. We need to choose our battles wisely, guys. Guys, This world is not our home. So we shouldn't try to, you know, oh, I'm going to fight for my rights. Really? Because the Bible calls you a slave. You're a slave to Jesus Christ or you're a slave to sin. Everyone in this world is a slave. They're either slaves to Jesus or they're slaves to the flesh. I'd rather serve Jesus than my flesh. Amen. You know, we live in a fallen world. It's not always going to be fair, but we should always strive to do what's right. And sometimes, as you guys have seen, that will make you enemies. Trying to do the right thing sometimes will make you enemies. But you can't compromise. You know, in my own case, usually it's my own, uh, my own stupidity <laughs> that gets me in trouble. But even then, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? It's better to be humble and to humble ourselves and seek peace than it is to die on the wrong hill. And I can't tell you how many Christians I've met that will just battle tooth and nail over things that don't even matter. <laughs> I'm not thinking about anyone. Hey, that's the Holy Spirit, brother. <laughs> no, but it's true, right? I mean, we all struggle with this, guys. Right? We all struggle with this. We all want to fight the wrong battle sometimes. We all want to die on the wrong hill sometimes. But the reality is at the end of the day, just think of it like this. Is this even going to matter in eternity? You know, these little things that we let get us flustered and get under our skin and put us in the flesh. Are they even going to matter in eternity? No, we just got to have that heavenly perspective, that eternal perspective. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment. Take a look at verses 27 and 28. We're, we're wrapping it up. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's the same as verses 21 and 22. Sin is conceived in our hearts and borne out by our actions downstream. Adultery doesn't just magically happen. Murder doesn't magically happen. It's a process that began in the heart long ago. Right? And eventually... When it's full grown, the Bible tells us sin, sin brings forth death, right? It's an issue of the heart. Or as the old saying goes, at the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. <laughs> it's true. You know, but the, the lust of the eyes is, a, is an especially pernicious sin in that it steals our own. Not only does it hurt those we love, but it steals our own joy and appreciation and satisfaction and contentment with our mate, right? Imagine if God gave you a nice 2,000 square foot house, you know, four bedrooms, two car garage, great neighborhood, everything's great. Everything's perfect. Wouldn't you be appreciative? We're renters to the rapture, so that would be like, what? That'd be awesome, right? That'd be amazing. Now, do you think you would appreciate it as much if every day you went and drove up through Eagle and looked at all the mansions and thought, wow, I sure would love to have that one. Wow, look at that one, honey. That one's got a four-car garage. It's got like a little turnaround in the front. You don't even have to reverse. You just drive through your, wow. Honey, look at that one. It's got like a, a pool. Is that a jacuzzi? Oh my gosh, that jacuzzi is bigger than a pool. You think you'd be happy with the one that God gave you? Probably not, huh? Imagine if someone gave you a real nice car. They give you like a, a 2019, you know, Mercedes Benz or whatever, Corvette. You'd be like, that's awesome. Wow, thank you, Jesus, right? You think you'd have that same appreciation if every day you went down to the Ferrari dealership and, wow, look at that Ferrari, man. That thing's pretty nice. You wouldn't appreciate it as much, would you? That's exactly what we're doing 
when we let the lust of the eyes destroy our satisfaction and contentment with what God's given us. Crazy, huh? And what's the solution? Take a look at verses 29 and 30. We'll wrap it up here. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Whoa. A lot of people do not like this verse and they will spend so much, they will cut down so many trees to write so many books to explain to us how Jesus doesn't really mean what he's saying here. Because it doesn't mesh well with the brand of comfortable Christianity that most people have adopted. Because at the core of what Christ is calling for here is a life that's lived in light of eternity. A life lived with an eternal perspective. Remembering that this life is a test. It's a race. It's a battle. And the only way we win that race, the only way we win that battle is by going to war with the flesh. Not giving place to the flesh. We got to go to war with the sin in our lives. No, not the sin in your wife's life or your husband's life. That's what we want. I hate sin. In my life, it's okay. But when my spouse sins, it's horrible. No, hate your own sin. We can't take sin lightly. It needs to be cut. It, we need to cut it off. We got to cut it off. You know, if having a smartphone is too much of a temptation or being on social media or, you know, TV or video games, whatever it is, if that's too much of a distraction, if that's too much of a temptation, if that's become an idol in your life, whatever it is, cut it off. Get rid of it, man. And the truth is, guys, at the end of the day, it isn't our eyes or our hands that cause us to sin, right? It's our hearts. But fortunately, Jesus gives us new hearts. We're new creations in Christ. We still got to take every thought captive. We still need to guard our hearts. We still need to make war against the flesh, but it's no longer in our own strength that we do this. We don't have to cut off our hand or poke out our eye. We just need to take every thought captive living in the Spirit, being obedient to Christ. Because the flesh wars against the Spirit. And I don't need to tell you guys that. You all know. So here's the question. Is there anything in your life that you need to cut off and cast away from you? Is there anything that you're allowing in your life, allowing in your heart, that's causing you to sin? And going back to the opening verses of this morning's message, is there any environment that you're spending time in that's making you lose your saltiness or hide your light? If there is, make no provision for the flesh. Cut it off and cast it away from you. Because what God has for you in Christ is so much better. God has an amazing plan for you guys. And what comes next after this test? It's so much better than these temporary pleasures that sin brings in this life that always have horrible strings attached. He's got such a better thing for us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, what a, what a heavy message this morning, Lord, but what a message that we need to hear. Lord, here in the quietness of our own hearts, Lord, show us if there's anything that's holding us back from serving you. Lord, show us 
if there's anything that's causing us to sin, that's causing us to lose our saltiness or to hide our light. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, give us the strength to remove those things from our lives in the name of Jesus. That we can live lives that are sold out for you. That we can run our race with endurance that you've set before us. So Lord, speak to our hearts. Strengthen us. Use us for your glory to build your kingdom. Let your name be glorified in our lives. We love you so much, Lord. You're worthy. And you have incredible plans for us in eternity. Help us to never forget that. And bless the time of fellowship that we're going to have now. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Save us all. There is hope.